live from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and on Mars, I want to present to you the team that has brought us back to Mars tonight. one more round of applause now that we've got them all up here. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Mars, I mean, uh, to, to, uh, to NASA. Uh, about an hour and a half ago, I went outside and looked toward the west, and I saw Mars there, and I said, in an hour and a half, you are going to have a visitor. And the planet smiled, and I knew that we were going to have good luck. So with this, I want to introduce you our fearless leader, Charlie Bolden. Boy, I tell you, uh, Charles, thanks very much. First of all, just let me, let me say thanks very much to the entire team. And all the teams not here. Uh, some of the teams in places like Canberra, Australia, and up in Goldstone, because the Deep Space Network was what made it possible for us to be getting all the data and everything. So, you know, but today, right now, the wheels of curiosity have begun to blaze the trail for human footprints on Mars. Uh, curiosity, the most sophisticated rover ever built, is now on the surface of the red planet, where it will seek to answer age-old questions about whether life ever existed there on Mars, or if the planet can sustain life in the future. This is an amazing achievement made possible by a team of scientists and engineers from around the world, and led by the extraordinary men and women of NASA and our Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Nothing in robotic planetary exploration is harder, more technically challenging, or as risky as landing on the surface of Mars. And I know most of you are saying, how can he be saying that? It just looks so easy. Uh, <laughs> trust me. Historically, counting all the missions by all countries, the odds of success are about 40%. The recent U.S. record is better, with now six successful missions, including now four landings. And um, I'm going to stray from my script here for a moment, which is always dangerous. But tonight, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm not probably not going to include all the countries. But tonight, there are at least four countries, and I won't name them, uh, who are on Mars, and they're on Mars because they went with the United States. So. Uh, I, I know this may sound a little strange in this international environment, but I want everyone to understand what I say and what I mean when I say, you know, our leadership is going to make this world better. Uh, tonight, <laughs> as, in, as incredible as our feat was tonight, uh, we just succeeded one more time in raising the bar even higher. New technologies never invented or attempted before were created for this incredible journey. Curiosity's final descent was dubbed seven minutes of terror because in its seven minute trip to the surface, it had to slow down from 13,000 miles an hour to zero. Uh, and I think you've heard this before, that's like driving 65 miles an hour on a freeway and coming to a complete stop in about 2.1 seconds. Hundreds of other things had to go just right including a parachute slowdown at supersonic speed, eight rocket engines to power a final descent and final soft landing by a new sky crane landing system. Curiosity will spend the next two years seeking answers to one of humanity's oldest questions as it investigates whether conditions have favored development of microbial life on the red planet. President Obama has laid out a bold vision for sending humans to Mars, 
and today's landing marks a significant step toward achieving this goal. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, a very dear friend of mine. He is the President's Science Advisor, the, the Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and a guy who was sweating through this. And uh, as he told me a little while ago, he thought he was going to throw up at one point. <laughs> and he's probably mad because I told you that, but my friend, Dr. John Holdren. I wanted to start by saying thank you for sharing that, Charlie. <laughs> well, today on Mars, history was made on Earth. The successful landing of Curiosity, which is, as Charlie has said, the most sophisticated roving laboratory ever sent to another planet, marks what is really an unprecedented technological tour de force. It will stand as an American point of pride far into the future. It's also just the latest example of a long-standing truth about the United States, that even the longest of odds are no match for America's unique blend of technical acumen and gutsy determination. Our, <clears throat> and that's certainly for all of the folks at JPL, at Caltech, at NASA, and our partners whose instruments, as Charlie has pointed out, were on this, uh, this lander. Uh, thanks, big thanks are due uh, to all of them. Our continued preeminence and progress in space and here on Earth in other domains such as biomedicine and healthcare, clean energy, national security, advanced manufacturing, all of this depends on our continuing commitment to science, technology, and innovation, and the passion for adventure that has driven us to explore new worlds. By sustaining our investments in basic research and exploration, we ensure that America will remain at the forefront of the scientific frontier. So I really want to personally congratulate on behalf of myself, but also on behalf of my boss, President Obama, the team here at JPL, at NASA, and around the country that contributed to this spectacular achievement. I can only imagine what incredible data and new understandings are going to be uncovered in the coming days, months, and years because of this success. Landing the Mars Science Laboratory rover, Curiosity, on the surface of the Red Planet was by any measure the most challenging mission ever attempted in the history of robotic planetary exploration. And if anybody has been harboring doubts about the status of U.S. leadership in space, well, there's a one-ton automobile-sized piece of American ingenuity <laughs> on the... <coughs> That is, <clears throat> and it's sitting on the surface of Mars right now, and it should certainly put any such doubts to rest. President Obama has challenged America, as Administrator Bolden just said, to send humans to Mars in the 2030s. And Curiosity is going to provide critical information about the red planet and what our astronauts will find once they arrive. The administration is committed to a vibrant and coordinated strategy of Mars exploration and planetary exploration more generally, and continuing America's leadership here on Earth and throughout the solar system. So congratulations again, and long live American curiosity. Thank you. Let me thank all of you one more time. John Holder and I, unfortunately, have got to go boogie to go somewhere else. We're going to leave you in the, in the, in the very erstwhile hands of Charles Alachi and the technical team, and, and they've got a little bit more detailed stuff to tell you. So ha have a great night, and congratulations to all of you again. Thank you. Okay, guys, before we start, we have a new picture of Mars. Come in. Here comes the rest of the EDL team, the Mars Curiosity team entering right now. They are quite happy.
so what what is your order that you are doing? Um, but but somebody put it in. Okay, I think we need to get... Okay, can we get everybody seated? <laughs> okay, can we get everybody? I need to take control of this thing. <laughs> Okay, can we get... Yeah, can we, can we, no, can we have it stop people coming? Okay, can we stop please? Can we get everybody seated? Okay, needless to say, there is a lot of excitement in this room. Okay, good night. Good, good evening, everybody.
Okay, can we get everybody, please? Can we get quiet, please? Please, everybody, can we get quiet? I'm sure all of you want to hear about how things went. Well, tonight was, was a great drama that was played. I felt like an adventure movie, but in reality, I kept telling myself, this is real. This is real, what's happening, and what a fantastic demonstration of what our nation and our agency you know, can do. Uh, I could only think of the words of Teddy Roosevelt as I was sitting there. It is far better to dare mighty things even though we might fail than to stay in a twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. And the team brought us victory, you know, today. I can also only think about the Olympians. Here we had our team, which went to the Olympics. We were not sure we were going to win, but this team came back with the gold. So thank you guys. We are so proud of you. And, and just think what an inspiration to the young people in the world by watching what these young people and old people like me have accomplished. It's really inspiring. I just was talking to my daughter and she was crying, you know, about it, how exciting this is, and how inspirational. So we hope that the tens of millions of people who have been sharing this adventure with us will be the people who will be carrying the torch, you know, and continuing our exploration of the solar system. And what a bargain that we got this mission for. This movie costed you less than seven bucks per American citizen. And look at the excitement that we have brought and the inspiration that we have brought. And tonight we just did the landing. Tomorrow we're going to start exploring Mars. And next week, and next month, and next year, we'll be bringing new, new discovery every day, every week to all of you. And we are going to continue not only exploring Mars, but exploring the solar system and exploring the universe, because our curiosity has no limit. Thank you all, and I'm going to introduce John Gransfeld, who is the head of space science at NASA. Sound? Great. You know, we said before uh, landing this afternoon, Charles and I here, that, that Mars is hard and success is not guaranteed. Uh, there are many out in the community who say that NASA has lost its way, that we don't know how to explore, that we've lost our moxie. I want you to look around tonight, all those folks with the blue shirts, think about what we've achieved. I think it's fair to say that NASA knows how to explore. We've been exploring, and we're on Mars. And while it certainly is an international co collaboration, and we, and we welcome the participation, uh, this feat, this feat that you've seen tonight is something that only the United States of America can do, and the rover is made in the USA. Yeah. And just to stay in character, we've been on the surface for one hour, eight minutes, and 16 seconds. The last eight months, and certainly for the seven minutes of terror, has started to weave you know, an unbelievable story. Um, as we get ready to transition to surface ops, I think what we really need to pay attention to now is that the curiosity story is just beginning. And with that, I'll turn it over to the team. Pete, that's the guy in charge of this project. <laughs>
I think you can tell that the team is ecstatic at tonight's results. <laughs> um, this has been an, an incredible feeling for, uh, for me personally, um, not only to be associated with such a tremendous event, but to um, have the privilege uh, to be able to, to be uh, asked to lead such an incredible team of people. I mean, uh, as easy as it looked tonight, and it wasn't, but as easy as it looked tonight is because of the people in the blue shirts are standing around you and because of thousands of others around this country, around the world, who worked on this for, for seven, eight years to cause this to come to being. I mean, they've done an incredible job. It, it is, there's, words cannot state the kind of job that they've done. Um, eight years ago, I sat on this stage and talked to some of you uh, after the landing of Spirit and then three weeks later after the landing of Opportunity. And I never thought I would ever say this, but this is better than that. <laughs> I want to thank everyone who worked so hard on this, uh, this project directly, um, some of the people who've, who've left the project because their work has been done, and, and, uh, but they're with us in spirit tonight and, and have shared in the success. Um, I want to thank, and I want them to thank, all the support of them, their, their significant others and their families and their friends. This work is very hard, it's very demanding, and without the support at the home front, it can't be done successfully. And I know, um, I know that my wife is, without whom I could not do this job, is, is, is a wonderful person. I'm sure that the team shares that attribute with their families as well. Um, but I especially want to thank, and I especially want to recognize the gentleman who's sitting to my left, and that's Richard Cook. Um, he has put blood, sweat, and tears into this project. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but believe me, uh, we would not have been successful without him tonight. And, and, and when you look at his record, uh, Pathfinder, two MERS, and this one, unparalleled in, in the country today. I mean, just unparalleled. So I'll now let him humbly accept your accolades. So that rocked. Seriously, did, was that that cool or what? <laughs> Woo! Woo! I have been lucky enough to have done this now four times, and it never gets old. Seriously, it's just a great experience. And there are some people out there, Rob Manning and Dara Sabai and some of the other folks who have done this as many times, and I know they all just had the exact same experience as I did tonight, which just gets better every time. It just is amazing. Pathfinder was great, uh, but we were young and stupid, frankly. And, uh, and now to have an appreciation for how hard it is and how much effort it takes from, a, a, as Pete said, a team of hundreds of, and thousands of people around the world is uh, it's, it's just it's inspiring and it's a little bit uh, uh, overwhelming at times how much effort has been required and, and how much everybody deserves this great success we've had. I can't let uh, Pete compliment me without returning it and you know there is the guy who's been in charge of three of these things. Um, there's pretty much nothing nobody else in the world has that record to be the project manager for three Mars landings. Um, and so I think that he's going to have that, uh, no matter what he does from now on, he's going to know that he's the only guy in the world that's ever done that. So good job. There you go. Okay, well, then I want to also compliment the two guys to my left here. Let me start with the one furthest on the left there, who is, who is he's now got the keys. He's the guy that, uh, that's going to make this thing uh, just go down in the record books as far as what we were able to learn on the surface. And I know he's already looking at the picture saying, is that Mount Sharp? Or what can I see there? And all kinds of stuff. And so he's definitely, he's got the keys pretty soon. Not quite yet, but pretty soon he'll have the keys. Yeah, and... Uh, <laughs> And, and he'll make some great, uh, some, some great uh, history out of what, uh, what we've been able to do with this thing on the surface. And, and I know Curiosity 
um, will, we'll, as I said, really be a set the record, go down in the record books as an amazing scientific mission. Uh, but I can't let uh, the guy in between me go. My friend here, uh, Dr. Stelsner, has is, is been the, the, the father and the mother and everything in between of, <laughs> of the landing system we've, we've built and, uh, and certainly has been its biggest uh, proponent. I remember the re going to reviews and, and him saying, hey, I think this thing can work, and you guys just have to give the team a chance seven, eight years ago, and, uh, and then just stuck with it through every uh, t failed test, through every uh, <laughs> review that didn't quite work out the way we wanted it. Uh, and so he is, uh, really deserves a huge amount of credit for, what, uh, for what's happened tonight, and uh, hopefully everybody uh, appreciates his, his contributions. I know I certainly do. So. <laughs> Say something profound. <laughs> I am terribly humbled by this experience. I forever, secretly, have felt that I do not deserve to be in the position of leading the team that I lead because they are certainly in sum and largely by count of individual more capable than I. That great things take many people working together to make them happen is one of the fantastic things of human existence. And in my life, I am and will be forever satisfied if this is the greatest thing that I have ever given. There is a new picture of a new place on Mars. And for me, at least, that's the big payoff. And to work as part of such a talented group of people, shepherded by Pete and Richard. And I'm not just talking about the EDL team, I'm talking about the entire team, soup to nuts. The caliber of people here at JPL, the other centers who contribute. It's a tremendous honor and it is a humbling experience to work with them. And I, I think that this nation is a truly great representation of a, of a corner or a piece of humanity that reaches out and explores and conquers and engineers. We are kind of tool makers, agriculturalists, pioneers, and, and that's reflected in the activities and actions and results of tonight. So, I want to say thank you to the blue shirts. <laughs> say something. Adam and his wife are expecting a baby in three weeks, so we wish them the great luck. Thank you, Tyler. Tyler, number two. Child number two. Yes, my second daughter comes in in just a few weeks here. Um, we, My wife has been calm at home, or actually she's in Beckman Auditorium, but she was debating because the last thing we didn't want to have is two babies born on the same night. <laughs> a couple of other groups of folks that I'd like to thank that I think we all are thankful for. Uh, certainly, this beautiful theater of tonight, the drama of us all being able to experience it together, comes through the efforts of the Odyssey project and the Odyssey spacecraft and that team being able to dip that bent pipe UHF telemetry to us, unrivaled in the experience for all of us. And naturally, the DSN and the, uh, and the X-band telemetry that really allowed us to back that up 
Um, so please, a round of applause for our calm. And with that, really, I have nothing more to say. That picture says it all for me. Thank you, Adam, for getting us on the, on the surface. I think that is the best picture of Mars I've ever seen. <laughs> and I can guarantee you in the days uh, hours and months and years from now, you're going to be hearing about an incredible science story, and I'm not going to bore you with that tonight. You're going to have to wait for that one, because on behalf of everybody on the science team, 406 team members, we thank everybody that was involved in this enterprise, Charles, Pete, Richard, Adam, everybody that pulled this together. There were over 3,500 JPL employees. I won't count contractors and subcontractors, but I'm sure there were thousands more. Nine science instruments, <clears throat> 10 science instruments, nine principal investigators, seven countries, Germany, France, Spain, Russia, Denmark, Britain, Canada. All of us are the beneficiaries of your hard work. We've hardly even scratched the surface, and you're seeing it right there. And. I just want to leave you with one thought about what this success brings to everybody that is involved in this enterprise. There is no greater inspiration for middle school children that are going to math, science, and engineering than a mission to Mars. The number of hits on the website is unparalleled. The emphasis on the excitement that this generates is what we bestow upon our children. The money Two and a half billion dollars. We don't put it in the rover and send it to Mars. We spend it here on Earth. And Charles mentioned at the beginning that this whole enterprise, if you divide it by every woman, child, man in this country, comes out to be the cost of the movie. I know I speak on behalf of all my colleagues in science. That's a movie I want to see. So thank you all. open it up to questions now from the news media and um, it, let me wait for a microphone to come over to you and uh, go ahead and give us your name and affiliation right there in the middle of the row. Go ahead, Craig. Hi, Craig. With America Space. Um, Adam, uh, tell us about the landing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Craig. Um, I can't tell you too much about it. I mean, it looks good. Uh, I'm being a little flip. Uh, in short, it looked extremely clean. Uh, we had, uh, yeah, we had, uh, we had, we touched down in conditions that were um, on the more benign side of our nominal expectation. Our. Um, by, by the way, I want to preface everything. This is preliminary data scooped with the sieve in the cacophony of the control room, control room during the celebration, right? And largely by my good friend Miguel San Martin, who's somewhere out there, I hope. At any rate, um, very nominal, uh, remarkably good uh, um, our navigation error was, uh, was on the low side of our expectation, which meant that we probably had a good alignment between the celestial center sensors and the inertial, uh, inertial sensors, the IMU. Um, our powered flight appears to have been excellent. If my good friend Ben Toma is in the house, is Ben in the house? We landed with... Um, 
140 kilograms of fuel reserves out of a total of 400 kilos that we carried in. And we're going to, Ben worked quite diligently in stretching the tanks at my insistence because I was worried we wouldn't have enough fuel. And so I think I owe Ben a little bit of an apology there. <laughs> so uh, it looked good, in short. Good and clean. And, and it looks, at least by my eyeball, that we uh, landed in a nice, flat spot. Beautiful. <laughs> really beautiful. Shani Jardin from boingboing.net, and I'm going to stand in for Miles O'Brien with PBS NewsHour tonight. What you kind look more attractive than Miles. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell him that, Adam. OK. I think he heard and it. What, <laughs> I, I have to ask you, what kind of file type? Can you tell us about the image file type and compression that was used to send this very important uh, couple of thumbnails back from Mars? Yes, unfortunately, I absolutely cannot. <laughs> <laughs> if Justin Mackey is in the room or there's a couple other people on the team who'd be able to whip that out quickly, but I, I don't, couldn't tell you. Sorry. Okay, uh, we're going across the aisle over here. Let me just wait for the mic runner right there. Thank you. Hi, Sally Rail with the Planetary Society, and um, this is for Adam. Uh, two very quick questions. Well, first one's quick. Are you going to call your daughter Curiosity? <laughs> <laughs> It is true that I think that curiosity is perhaps the central defining human attribute. I really do. And I was, Richard and I were both part of a group of people who were, select, were in the process of helping winnow, winnow down the names of the, the, that the school kids had taken. And there was, I don't know, a couple hundred that we looked at. And curiosity was one of them. And I was smitten from the moment I saw that. And I'm so happy that the rover is curiosity. Okay, the next question is a little is more than what? 48 hours ago. Right Carla's there. right there. Come on, Carla. Stand, stand up. up. Stand, Claire, do you up. Want to stand up. Go ahead. My daughter's name will not be curiosity. <laughs> okay. A serious question. A little more than 48 hours ago, you told me you would tell me a secret. Once curiosity landed. Can I have my secret? Yeah, what was this? A lot has happened in the last 48 hours. And to be very truthful, I do not recall what that secret was. I'm going to hold you to this. That's fine. Maybe I'll remember it. Okay, I'm um, looking for the next question up here, a little forward there. Thank you. Thank you, um, Olivier Sanguy and joyspace.com from France. So, thank you for ChemCam and SamGT, which is a French participative, participation thank you too. instrument. Thank you. <laughs> we did a webcast in France, uh, in French, for people following, and I, uh, I made a contract with Ustream saying, oh, there are not going to be a lot of people. Okay. Well, 40,000. Uh, and I said 4,000. Okay. Sorry for that. Anyway, uh, there is international cooperation and curiosity. Of course, it's an American success for the landing. I would like to know how this cooperation goes with the other countries. I think you learn something. I mean, engineers are engineers. Data is data. Numbers are numbers in every country. But you do have your own habits. Mm -hmm. How did you manage with that? Was that fine? Was there tensions? Enrichment, cultural, perhaps? You, the question is uh, with the other countries? Yes. Yes. Uh, what did you learn with the others? Right, I'll let Richard think, answer that one. I think that it, uh, you know, in each case, because we were working part of this with the science teams, um, we had very good relations with the other countries that were working on it. In particular, the Spanish, and, you know, who built the high gain antenna for us, as well as one of the instruments. You know, we had people who, engineers on our side, who would, who would work closely with their teams. Very, very capable people, you know, companies and organizations and personnel working on those efforts over there. Um, so we certainly had our problems. We had our problems even on the U.S. parts of this. I mean, this is a challenging development, um, and there were there were challenges on on almost every piece of the vehicle. Um, so I, w you know, I think that my experience with working with the overseas elements uh, was very good. That they're quite capable, and I think that you know, hopefully they'll gain what 
the expertise they gain on this project, they'll be able to take that and to, to use it on their own endeavors in the future. So. Okay, we're going next over here. Uh, Leo Enright from Irish Television. Uh, the, the unmanned spaceflight uh, website has uh, uh, coordinates <laughs> for the landing that go down to something like five decimal points. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to confirm with you that, that, those, those, that you do have them, have those sort of coordinates. And am I reading those coordinates correctly when I see that it looks as though you've landed within 500 meters of the uh, skirt around the mountain? That, I mean, you're really very close to the mountain at the closer end in the landing ellipse and possibly within striking distance of the phyllosilicate trench. I, can, I can't confirm that. Um, my estimate, I'm looking for somebody, yes, there's somebody in the audience here who has that in the tip of their noggin. Um, we should have soon that estimate, uh, but I, I don't have it to five decimal places. Uh, we wouldn't report it to that because we don't, we're certain that we don't know it to that. Um, and I don't know what the space, unmannedspaceflight.com uh, estimate is. Yeah, there's a team of people that are working on localization, including what information we got uh, on the way down, you know, the nav, uh, nav filter, probably taking a picture at where, <laughs> looking at the picture uh, and trying to figure out from there where we are. I would imagine by tomorrow, tomorrow's press conferences, they should have a better idea where, where it came down within a few hundred meters at least, hopefully. Okay, the next question's over on this side. Um, I'm Chief Fei Fan from TVBS Taiwan. We also have a live event in Taiwan. This is actually a question from our audience, which is, uh, I think she's like around 10 years old girl. <laughs> and she wants to know if it is possible, if there is any opportunity that JPL would consider to open up the opportunity for students to operate curiosity <laughs> in Mars, and then especially students from overseas. I want you to know, I want you to know if the answer is yes, I want to say my name right now. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you in all honesty, first we have to let them wait for the scientists to operate it, so. Okay, we have a question. Um, Henry, you're next. Henry Bortman with Astrobiology Magazine. Can you tell us uh, at what time Curiosity touched down Earth received time and at what time the first image came back? I can tell you the first of those is 10.39 p.m. The second of those I don't have. Go here in the center of the room. Um, Ron, the from Scholastic. Um, <laughs> um, both Charles and uh, John said that this is very much of an inspiration to young people. Can you tell me what inspired you when you were growing up? What, did, what made you decide to join NASA and do all of this amazing work? Well, let me start. Uh, I was inspired by the first astronauts, the Gemini program, the Apollo program. And specifically, here we are, uh, still in the heart of summer, and I remember being brought into the mess hall at summer camp uh, to s look at a small black and white TV along with a couple hundred other boys. It was a boys' camp in central Wisconsin to see Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon, July 21st, 1969. And that stuck with me and inspired me uh, to go on to become a physicist, a scientist, to study math and science throughout school, uh, eventually, uh, to apply to the astronaut corps to go to space uh, and I hope uh, and it, it was a dream of mine for this evening and I think we've achieved that uh, that for kids today uh, actually for everyone today that this landing of curiosity on the surface of Mars will be an inspiration uh, that will lead people to think about the great science that's ahead of us uh, and to go on to do great things uh, someone else gestures at me out there in the audience, and so I'm not sure what, I'm trying to interpret what he's doing. I mean, I think the thing, as, so the, the kinds of, I didn't have a, a specific activity or thing, uh, like John said, that inspired me, but so much as 
being able to do problem solving, right? And, and the, the thing that we do here, and NASA does, and JPL does, is we solve problems. And we solve problems that involve, uh, you know, obviously very state-of-the-art activities, but also things that require large teams of people working together in a really intimate way that is really different, I think, than almost any other human endeavor. It's amazing to solve a problem as complicated as landing on the surface of Mars, where you're utterly dependent on, you know, a team of 100 or 200 or 1,000 other people to do their parts and to do it to solve their problems and have all those problems work together. And it's just the scale of that endeavor, that problem solving that is what got me attracted to working for, for NASA and for JPL. And, and uh, I think that's, if I were to talk to, to my kids or to kids, you know, the, to go in this, this field, that's the kind of thing that NASA and JPL does. Um, and, and it's really, if you're interested in that sort of problem or in that sort of uh, activity, this is the place to come and do it. Okay, go ahead. Um, Raphael Jaffe with uh, Aerotech News and Review up in Lancaster. Uh, what am I really seeing in that photo that is behind you? Uh, and I heard some, uh, something about a second photo, uh, shadow of the curiosity being seen, and wheels, uh, or a wheel of the curiosity. So could you lead me through that photo? Uh, maybe John or Adam or somebody. Thank you. Um, well, I can just tell you, I mean, yes, what you're seeing in the first picture that you said, that was the shadow of, of curiosity um, there in the, in the view. These are the rear has cam views, so we're looking out the back of the rover. Uh, I don't think we got any of the front has cams. That's front. Oh, is it front? Okay. Yeah, it is. Thank you. It's front. There we go. The other one is, is the rear, and that is the wheel you see in the lower corner there. We do expect to get more pictures back in this uh, upcoming Odyssey Pass, which hopefully will be in about 25 minutes here, so we'll get yet more pictures. Uh, and these images were actually through the cover, and actually if you go back to the other one uh, for a second, can you switch to the other picture? You can see those little speckles around the, the, the black little dots or speckles around the outside, um, which is probably dust kicked up you know, during the landing event that stuck onto the covers, and so it's good that we have covers, <laughs> because now we'll take those covers off and those, those uh, Hopefully those, uh, those specks of dust will, will not be visible in the next set of pictures we'll get. Okay. Burkhard Bilgo, the, the New Yorker. Um, I may be imagining this, but the one time during the landing the, the temperature seemed to drop in the room was when Adam asked for OD 278, and they said, no, we only have 277. What was happening, or was it anything of significance? Mm, no. <laughs> We are, um, as we're coming in, the navigators are continuing to make OD's orbital determination, where the spacecraft is, and updating, and they all have numbers, an estimate, an estimate, an estimate. And, and they get better as, as Mars grabs us and the, and the pull of Mars um, uh, reduce some of the in inherent uncertainty in that estimate. While that's going on, while EDL is happening, in the EDL war room in a different building, you were seeing it on some of the cameras, um, the flight dynamics team is running simulations to the ground with our simulation tool um, based on those updated ODs. And so I had seen that OD 228 had come up, and I was asking if they had that, because I had had it, and they hadn't. They didn't have it over there yet, and they hadn't started it. That was what that was about. Uh, let me get a new question over here. Uh, Ian Thompson from The Register. Um, question for John Grotzinger. Um, you now get the keys to this, and you can um, sort of get it moving along. What's the first <laughs> stages that you'll go through in terms, of, in terms of getting Curiosity out there, and potentially how long could it survive on Mars beyond the two-year span? Um, I'll take a swipe at the first one. Uh, you know, we just want to get going first and, and check out all of the engineering <clears throat> systems and the science instruments. And this is a very, very, very complex spacecraft compared to what we've done before. And, and so because of that, we'll go through this long checkout period. 
called the commissioning activity period. And, uh, <clears throat> and Pete and Richard will be watching this very carefully. And we're gonna make sure that we're firing on all cylinders before we blaze out across the, the planes there. But nested within those uh, initial um, tests are gonna be science observations. And, and so we have a plan uh, to begin working through those as we test out the instruments. And in the next few days, uh, you guys will be able to see uh, some of the images. You'll see the results of the instrument health and aliveness checks and how we do. But the best way to think about this mission is on the order of days, weeks, months, and, and years. And, and we can loosely bound things. I think we expect to spend a couple of weeks checking things out, <clears throat> and then maybe taking the first drive a short distance to some place where we'll go through the second phase of commissioning. And then in a matter of months, we, we hope to have used all of the instruments, and in, including the SAM and the Kemen instruments, and done some scooping and drilling. And you know, possibly within a year or so, we, we could be at the base of Mount Sharp, because the place we landed on looks pretty darn interesting, and we just don't want to rush out of there without having studied it real well. So uh, it's the missions about patience and and uh, and, uh, and and checking things out carefully. John and I have a bet as to whether or not we'll, how long it will take us to get to Mount Sharp because my version of the surface mission is that it's like going on a family vacation and driving from here to Chicago, and except for your family has got 400 scientists who want to stop and look at every every fossilized whatever they can find. And, uh, and so, so he says it's not gonna take that long and I, I don't believe him. I so. Richard's gonna win. Yeah. John's gonna search for the biggest ball of twine in Gale. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in terms of the second part of your question, there is no inherent consumables on the spacecraft. We don't have gas or something we run out of uh, inherently. Um, we test the, the, the life-limiting characteristics tend to be the mechanisms, the motors, and those things. They tend to be outside in the cold, so they suffer the greatest uh, thermal uh, 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 highs and lows. And we test those for three times life, and, and we don't test them to failure. So the nominal mission for this is two years, but I think uh, if it lasts twice that, I don't think anyone would be shocked. Um, and that's the first time anyone's ever gotten me to say anything more than two years. <laughs> So I think, it, I think, you know, uh, John's right. We've got, um, uh, we've got a long mission ahead of us, and, and because of that and the capabilities of this rover, we have this possibility for just monumental science accomplishments and the target we've gone to. I mean, this Mount Sharp is just, you know, this whole, this whole story of Mars, and, and, and we just can explore and explore and explore across that. The other side of that is, as I've said to the team, and, and I'll repeat it to, to the press here, is that we're in no hurry. Okay, we have now have, as I said to the team, on 1032 tonight, we would have a priceless asset, a priceless national asset, okay? And we are not going to pardon the French, screw it up, okay? And therefore, we will take our time to understand its condition and understand if there's anything that happened during landing that we haven't uncovered yet. We will take our time to make sure that we understand how to operate it in this new and challenging environment. And then we will, with slow, deliberate, methodical pace, we'll begin the science explorations that the science team wants to take. So, um, so be patient with us, please, because we will be patient with, uh, with curiosity. Just realize that this is the second rover we have operating on the surface of Mars at the same time. That's pretty yes. spectacular to have, to have opportunity still there eight years later and curiosity both doing its thing. Continuous roving, continuous roving presence on the surface of Mars for in excess of eight years now. With that, we're going to end tonight's uh, news conference. We know that there is a um, next Odyssey Pass coming up at about 1240, and um, we're going to let you all take your time, get back up there, and get back to work. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, stay tuned for our next commentary session that we will begin at around 1230 for that overpass of the Odyssey spacecraft. And then follow the mission. Stay with us at www.nasa.gov MSL for more updates. Join us tomorrow for an, another news conference at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Thank you so much. <laughs>